Welcome to episode three of this new season of SageMaker Fridays. My name is Julian, and I'm a principal developer advocate focusing on AI and machine learning. Please meet my co-presenter today. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ségolène, and I am a senior data scientist working with the AWS Machine Learning Solution Lab. Great. It's nice to have you uh, on board to uh, help us understand machine learning. Uh, so everybody watching this, let me remind you that episodes are live. Um, feel free to ask all your questions in the chat. We have uh, friendly moderators uh, to answer everything. Okay. And remember, don't be shy. There are no silly questions. Make sure you learn as much as possible, which is really our main purpose today. Okay, so let's get started with this new episode. In the first two episodes, we discussed predictive maintenance and uh, demand forecasting, and we dived pretty deep into time series, LSTMs. I hope you all recovered. Uh, I think we did. So that was quite fun, and it's time to talk about something else. Uh, so this week, we're going to explore another very important topic and a popular use case for machine learning, and that is fraud detection. So, Segolen, can you introduce that topic for us? It's a big one, too. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, fraud uh, is a very uh, important problem uh, that can cost, uh, biz uh, cost business billions of uh, dollars uh, annually mm. and damage, of course, uh, customer trust. Um, many companies use a rule-based approach uh, to detect uh, fraudulent activity where fraud patterns are defined as rules. But implementing and maintaining a rule-based uh, model uh, can be very complex and um, a very time-consuming process uh, because, of course, uh, fraud is uh, constantly evolving mm. and rules require uh, fraud patterns to be known, etc. So, um, and after, you can have this big problem uh, to have some false positive and uh, false negative. Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea is uh, to better, uh, to today we are going to try to uh, better understand uh, the fraud, uh, how they happen, and uh, again, a kind of risk management system, a problem today again. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can see you know, why every company, literally everyone selling goods or services online should worry about fraud, right? Exactly. I mean, fraudsters are... Uh, extremely creative and the new types of fraud you know are, are sometimes pretty amazingly clever mm -mm -mm -mm. and uh, and it's very difficult to to keep track of that mm -hmm. and uh, and come up with business rules that would detect everything so machine learning to the rescue um, <laughs> And I'm sure we can we could probably use lots of different algorithms on on, on that problem so what are we going to rely on today? So today uh, we are going to work uh, first on an interesting uh, data set, uh, publicly available uh, anonymized credit card transaction uh, data set. Oh, okay, cool. And we are going to use a combination today of different uh, ML techniques and uh, algorithm. We are going to use first some, um, to use some unsupervised and supervised machine learning algorithm mm -hmm. and you will see how the random cut forest and the XGBoost model can be uh, very complementary and uh, can create a robust framework uh, for the fraud detection. Oh, so two algos now. Yeah, We're, two algos. Okay, <laughs> one is not enough. Okay. No. But don't tell me we have to implement two algorithms, right? No, Julia, <laughs> don't worry. Thank you. We are going to use some buildings, uh, built in algorithm in okay. SageMaker. All so right. Your next question so will be <laughs> What's a built in algorithm? So, like, it's a very good question. So, uh, Amazon SageMaker provides uh, several built in uh, machine learning algorithms, um, the most common uh, machine learning ones, okay. and uh, that you can use for a variety of uh, problem types. Mm -hmm. and when we say, we say uh, building algorithm, because um, this algorithm uh, has been already fine-tuned uh, by optimizing the data transfer between the instances and uh, to utilize uh, GPUs effect effectively uh, when needed. Mm -hmm. And um, another thing which is important with the building cell maker is that these algo are highly scalable uh, in the 
amount of data uh, they can learn from, uh, especially compared to the one uh, you can have on the open source uh, algorithm. And thanks to this optimization, uh, you can save ton of time and money. Okay, so I, I, that's a relief because uh, <laughs> working with one algo is already a bit of work. Yeah. Two algos, uh, you know, is, is too much for me. So okay. <laughs> Uh, so I, I do love those built-in algos. Um, they're off the shelf. We can just grab them. We can, uh, yeah. as you will see, and with very little code, we can train and deploy models. And it's it, they're they're great in so many ways because obviously, um, even if you're not familiar with uh, machine learning algos, you can just find the algo that works well on uh -huh. your type of problem and get to work. So you don't have to write the algo, but and also by saving that time, yeah, exactly. um, you can just focus on the machine learning problem, right? Mm -hmm. You can focus on exploring, understanding data, processing data. And, you know, a lot of people think uh, this is really the, the secret sauce to mm -hmm. getting great results, right? The algo is one thing, but how you understand and, and, and data and how you prepare data is really where you make a difference. So mm -hmm. uh, so it's good that we're not going to dive into uh, <laughs> algorithm code, al although we will explain the algos a little bit. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, okay, so get some coffee, um, anything that you need to keep you awake in the next uh, 45 <laughs> or 50 minutes. Uh, this is going to be another really fun uh, episode. And again, we hope you're going to learn a lot. Um, so we're using a GitHub repository again. So let me share my screen and show you uh, what we're going to use. All right. Okay, so this is it. Okay, so you can find it on, uh, on GitHub, of course. Uh, AWS Labs, fraud detection using machine learning. So you can just uh, clone this and uh, work with the notebook in the, in the source repository. And there's also a CloudFormation template if you want to create all the AWS resources and notebook instance, et cetera, to, uh, to run your notebook. And there's also some automation uh, um, topics here, creating a Lambda function, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we're, you know, um, in the interest of time, we're not going to go into everything here. We'll focus on the, on the machine learning part, but uh, there's actually quite a lot to, to study here, right? Feeding data, predicting with the models, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's the that's what we're uh, that's what we're working on. Okay. All right. Okay, so before we dive into the code, as usual, uh, let's uh, discuss the, the machine learning problem and, uh, and how we're going to solve it. Okay, so we mentioned we would be working with fraud detection mm -hmm. uh, using credit card data. Can you explain the, the problem a little bit for us? So the idea is that you're going to have uh, a lot of historical uh, transaction of uh, some credit card. Uh, and uh, the idea is like most of the time when you do some fraud detection, you've got some big files mm -hmm. and you want to detect when you're going to have like a fraud uh, transaction uh, in order of maybe to uh, prevent your customer or something like that. that there is something uh, which is not normal. So. Okay. And so the, so the data, we're going to look at the data set. In fact, it's been anonymized. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we're not going to see exactly which features are in there. But you know, we we could imagine features like um, uh, you know time of day, uh, yeah. day of week, um, amount of uh, the, the the transaction amount, uh, maybe the, uh, um, the the location, mm -hmm. uh, the source location of the transaction, mm -hmm. and you know the customer ID, and you know basically any any information that would be uh, that would be part of that transaction. Okay, but again, we're going to work with a, an anonymized data set, so we're not going to yeah. see that. Um, so before we actually uh, look at that, fraud detection is a very wide topic. Oh, uh, yeah. Here we're looking at credit cards, um, but fraud comes in many, many shapes. Mm -mm. Um, and and uh, one example is uh, you know, trying to build uh, fake domains mm. that look like uh, <laughs> real ones, right? Yeah. For phishing purposes and tr trying to basically uh, fool 
uh, customers and, and make them believe they're actually using um, uh, legitimate domains. And, uh, and we actually have a, a couple of really, really cool uh, use cases uh, from customers. So uh, one of them is a, is a French company called uh, Euler Hermes or uh, Euler Hermes, if you want to <laughs> try that. Um, <laughs> and another one is Infoblox. Um, and, and both companies are trying to uh, catch uh, suspicious domains, mm -hmm. you know, fake domains. Um, and, and those are pretty similar use cases where they use uh, natural language processing techniques on domain names and to mm -hmm. try and find if these are legitimate or of fake domains. I, I will include the uh, the links in the in the the, the last slide that you'll uh, see later today. Um, and of course, we have uh, financial services, mm -mm. right? Of course, credit cards. Um, companies like uh, a New Data Security, which is part of uh, Mastercard and Coinbase, are also using uh, AWS to build uh, fraud detection solutions. And uh, and Telco is a is a popular. Um, mm. Uh, popular vertical for uh, for fraud detection, trying to find you know fraud calls, people who call you and and want you to call back uh, ex super expensive numbers. <laughs> yeah. uh, I did a session uh, <laughs> uh, a couple of years ago with uh, Lebara, uh, the, the telco operator, and they were trying to identify all those crazy <laughs> techniques. And some of them are, like I said, amazingly clever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they're fraudulent, but still very clever. And, and you would need machine learning for that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, why don't we use statistical models for this? Um, because, um, and as, as I said during the introduction, is that um, most of the time, um, fraud detection is uh, maintained by pre, uh, rules-based uh, mm -hmm. process, uh, which are very uh, hard to maintain. But the idea is that uh, ML models um, don't use uh, predefined rules mm. uh, to determine whether activity is fraudulent or not. And instead, and I think it is like the real, um, business, the, the real business value added by the machine learning model is that they are trained uh, to recognize uh, fraud patterns in data. And the models are most of the time uh, self-learning. Uh, so mm. the model can uh, adapt to new and unknown uh, fraud patterns and this is crucial because yes as we as we said fraud is a continuously evolving problem and um, we will see later uh, during this episode but um, some kind of ml models uh, the unsupervised one allow us to extract uh, knowledge from unlabeled data mm. and uh, this is a very important stuff uh, to have uh, yeah, because I, you know, I, I was listening to you, and I was thinking, if we're dealing with credit card transactions or phone calls, mm -hmm. right? The amount of data is staggering. We're yeah. talking millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions <laughs> of, of, of uh, yeah, yeah, items. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you could catch some of those are as fraudulent and flag them, label them, and say, mm -hmm. okay, this is clearly fraud. We know, for example, this phone number is used for fraud. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every 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 call originating from there is fraud. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, first of all, labeling data is very time consuming, mm -hmm. and as you explained, you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> so, Good point. Good. so labeling data. When you for do. for such high volumes and such uh, complex yes. use cases is is a big problem, right? So that's why unsupervised learning is uh, can bring is value. Interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. So can you tell us a little more about the algorithms that we could consider today? Uh, yeah. So um, today, I think we we are going to show you today um, why uh, ML and AI um, are fascinating because uh, we, the data scientists, have a wide range of model techniques and algorithm at our disposal. And most of the time, uh, we can combine them uh, when we have to solve complex problems. So today, typically, fraud detection within uh, millions of uh, observations is hard, it's complex. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to try to combine different okay. types of ML. And uh, you know, it's like the primary colors, uh, red, blue, uh, and yellow for a painter. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you can mix them, uh, you have some new colors, like uh, green. And if we reformulate today uh, the business problem we have, uh, we want a way to define a fraud, 
uh, there's say, uh, yeah, an anomaly. Mm -hmm. And after, once we can put a label on each observ observation, uh, we want to classify our transaction into two classes, fraud and non-fraud, in order to detect uh, unlabeled observation in real time. So when a new fraud comes, uh, you are able to flag it uh, in real time. And um, so here, this is again, uh, we are going to create for some levels for, uh, for our data using some unsupervised learning technique. So mm -hmm. we are going to use a random code for our algorithm today. And once we get the level, uh, we're going to use a supervised learning uh, to create a binary classification, fraud, non fraud, okay. uh, which is today uh, the, X, the fa very famous uh, XGBoost uh, model. Okay, interesting. So, yeah. so. If we have labeled data, then we can use that mm -hmm. and supervise learning. Um, if we don't, or if we don't have enough, we could also try unsupervised learning. And in fact, we could combine. Combine. Yeah? yeah, you could you could do ensemble prediction and uh, and and uh, and score exactly a, a transaction with both models, and uh, and that's that's a good technique as well, right? It's funny. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna try that. Okay, um, so let's discuss the data set now. Okay. Um, so let me share my screen for a second. Okay. All right, let's give it a few seconds to show up. So th this is the data set that we're, uh, that we're using today. Uh, it's available on Kaggle. Uh -huh. Yeah, you can, uh, you can go and get it if you want. Um, and uh, so it's anonymized, mm -hmm. right? Because it's credit card data, so <laughs> you don't want... it's quite sensitive. You wouldn't <laughs> want uh, your credit card transactions to be to be available there. <laughs> and um, and when we say anonymized, uh, we actually mean that uh, the original data set has been transformed using an, another machine learning algorithm called PCA. PCA. Can you explain that a little bit? <laughs> It's like uh, the, um, so you can see that the PC is um, all the sensitive feature uh, have been masked uh, thanks to the principal component analysis, which is another. Yeah. Um, and it looks yeah, it looks like this. Yeah, exactly. So this is here at the beginning. You 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 add like some uh, sensitive data. So after a PCA, uh, you're going to be able, able to remove the sensitive content of your data. Uh, the PCA is another building algorithm in SageMaker okay. for your information. And um, PCA, so, so that data anonymiz anonymization is a very uh, important and interesting problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the PCA here is an, exa an example, but uh, you have, of course, plenty of other ones, uh, like encryption, etc. Okay. But, uh, All right, so we see 28 eight. features. So the, the actual amount has not been anonymized. We need to keep some uh, information. Yeah, content. yeah, we need to keep some information, and the, the, of course, the label. So zero means uh, it's okay. One means it's fraudulent. Mm -mm. Okay, but as you can see, everything else is completely, completely anonymized, right? So we have about two hundred eighty-five thousand transactions, mm. which is feels like a lot, mm. right? Feels like a lot of data. Um, is that enough? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a good, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, you know, people sometimes say that uh, the more data, uh, the better is the model. Mm -hmm. And honestly, with, uh, it is true uh, when we work on uh, fraud detection because uh, fortunately enough for your business, uh, mm -hmm. fraud and, uh, fraudulent activity is not uh, the most common. Right. Uh, so if, if it is the case, <laughs> It can be complicated for you. Yeah. So uh, you need to gather uh, enough data to have enough enough, enough fraud records um, to be able to learn uh, on top of them mm -hmm. thanks to uh, machine learning models. So out of those 285,000 transactions, mm -hmm. I think we only have 0 0.17 uh, yeah. percent. 0.17% fraudulent transactions. So that's about it's a little less than 500, I think. Yeah. And we'll see the exact number in a minute. So, as you can see, you know, you could say, well, I don't need almost 300,000 transactions. That feels like too much. But in fact, you only have 500 fraudulent transactions. Mm -hmm. So, 
and I will see later, it is actually uh, a hard problem to solve. Oh, right? yes. Uh, that, that <laughs> imbalance between the two classes, the, the non-fraudulent and the fraudulent. Mm -mm. So you're literally looking for the, the needle in the haystack. <laughs> so you need a big, big hex, haystack. Otherwise, you won't, literally won't see the fraudulent transactions. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we'll see, uh, we'll see how we can fix this uh, later. later on. Uh, and we'll use a library, actually. We'll use a, um, an open source library called Smote mm -hmm. uh, to try and fix uh, these imbalance problem. We'll, we'll get back to that. Okay, so here's the data set, right? Now, can we talk about the algorithms a little bit? So we said we would use XJBoost mm -hmm. and we would use Random Cut Forest. Yeah, exactly. So I have a couple of slides, of course, right? You know, we like to uh, talk about algos. So let's try and introduce those two algos <laughs> without going too crazy on the, on the details. Um, so I'll do XJBoost and you'll do Random Cut Forest? Perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do the one I kind of understand. Okay, uh, so XJBoost is a super, super popular algorithm. Uh, it, it wins a lot of uh, Kaggle yeah. competitions. It's very versatile. It has shown very to be very effective on a whole bunch of different problems. Uh, it's open source, of course. You can find it on GitHub. Uh, I also referenced the, uh, the paper on the uh, archive if you want to understand the, the finer points mm -hmm. of the fair. algo. So you can. It's based on trees, uh, and you can use it for regression, so predicting numerical values, classification, which is what we're doing today, mm -hmm. uh, and binary classification actually and ranking, which is another problem. So without going too deep, um, it, builds, it, build, it builds a forest of, mm -hmm. of trees, right? So it, it, it organizes sample into trees, um, but it's a you may be of course familiar with random forests uh, where we, uh, we build lots of different trees based on uh, uh, random selection of features and then mm -hmm. we do ensemble prediction with the trees. XJBoost is a little bit different because uh, we are going to build several trees, but each tree um, is built in a way that it corrects prediction mm -hmm. errors that are made by previous trees. Okay, so you build the first tree, fine, it makes some mistakes. Then you build a second tree that tries to fix the mistakes. And then you build a third tree that tries to fix the mistakes that are still there mm -hmm. after you predicted with one and two, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of a cumulative way, right, of, uh, no. of predicting and learning. And it's, uh, it's very, very interesting. Uh, the example you see on the slide is actually taken from the, from the research paper uh, where we try to predict if, uh, if a person is going to be uh, a video game fan. And, <laughs> um, and of course, it's a toy example. So we're assuming that if you're, uh, if you're younger than 15 and if you're a boy, uh, then you know, you're uh, probably more likely to play video games. <laughs> Uh, and uh, if you use your computer daily, which is another feature, uh, then again, you're probably more likely to be to be a gamer. Again, just a, just a toy example. So by building those trees using different features and by fixing uh, previous errors, you actually get to very, very mm -hmm. accurate classification. Mm -hmm. um, so and that's one of the reasons why XJBoost is so powerful. Uh, it has lots of other cool features, like if you have missing data, missing values, mm -hmm. um, it's very robust mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. uh, so even if you have unclean data, uh, it, it works very well. Uh, if you have sparse data, it works very well. Lots of zero, fe zero valued features, it's very uh, resilient. Uh, you can do distributed training with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can, uh, actually on SageMaker, you can do that very easily. We'll see how. And last but not least, if you have very large data sets that don't fit in RAM, yeah. Uh, you can actually train XJBoost on them. It's going to be slower because it's, it will load, uh, you know, partial data from from uh, stable storage, uh, but you can do it right, which which is a very nice uh, feature compared to lots of algos mm -hmm. who really need all data to be in RAM. So XJBoost, if you're doing machine learning, you know about XJBoost. Uh, yeah. if, if not, <laughs> it's one of those algos that you have to 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 know, right? It's a uh, 
a good Swiss army exactly. uh, knife kind of <laughs> Exactly. And after, yes, you've got a lot of uh, a, a high variety of hyperparameters that yeah. you can fine tune. And thanks to this fine tuning, you can reach some good um, results every time. And, yeah. Um, yeah, you can configure lots of crazy exactly. parameters. Although I would say, if you want to really understand what they do, you have to read the research paper. Ah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, just keep the defaults, uh, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is what I do because, uh, <laughs> you know, if you don't know any better like me, then uh, just, yeah, keep stick to defaults. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's XGBoost. We supervise learning. Uh, we'll start from label data, build a binary classifier. Mm -mm. Okay. Now, what about random cut forest? <laughs> So random um, cut forest is an uh, unsupervised um, algorithm uh, for detecting uh, anomalous data points uh, within a, a data set. Mm -hmm. um, the idea is that um, you're going to um, check the anomalies. So the anomalies can uh, manifest as unexpected unexpected spikes uh, in time series data, again, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, breaks in periodicity or uh, unclassifiable, unclassifiable data points. And in a nutshell, it's like unsupervised learning, so it's going to associate an anomaly score, uh, which is data points. Okay. Uh, so low score value uh, indicates that the data point is considered uh, like normal, and high value indicates uh, the presence of uh, an anomaly uh, in the uh, data. So after you get like, the definition of low and high, it yes. can be quite subjective and it depends on the application. But uh, common practice suggests that um, score beyond, I think it's three standard deviation from the mean score mm -hmm. are consider considered anomalous. So you're gonna uh, rank uh, attribute some score to each data point and based on that. Yeah, the really, really high ones yeah. need to be uh, checked. Check. Check. <laughs> okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. So we don't want to go into the math of, again, how the algo works, but uh, again, it's a, it's a tree based algo. Exactly. Okay. So uh, at training time, and we'll see this in the hyperparameters, at training time, again, we build. Uh, an ensemble of tree-based models mm -hmm. on random subsets of the data using random features. Okay, so we can, we can predict uh, using that. And the way we predict uh, is actually very clever. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we want to predict a new data point, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. uh, a, new, a new sample based on the, on the model, we take the sample and we, instruct, we insert it Mm -hmm. into every single tree that we build during training. Okay, so if you train 50 trees, then you insert that data point into the 50 trees, right? So it's literally adding a node, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a new node, or potentially a leaf uh, in the trees. <laughs> and you measure how much uh, disruption <laughs> was created. So how much displacement did you create by adding that sample to uh -uh. the trees? Uh -huh. so, the rationale and the intuition is if if the that node fits nicely into the trees and doesn't create the trees to be you know to grow much bigger or mm -hmm. to be uh, um, um, you know disrupted, then it's it's uh, it's it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not anomalous. Mm -hmm. If adding that node to all trees creates lots of disruption, lots of shuffling around in the trees, then it's probably an anomaly. And so the score that you mentioned. Is, is a measure of how much displacement and the, uh, the node has caused. And this is the reason why it's called a random cut forest. Yep. You know, <laughs> this, this name is... Uh, yeah, it's yeah. a good name. It's a good name, yeah. <laughs> uh, so you can read the research paper. I'll have to warn you, it's math heavy, um, but you can give it a shot. I mean, uh, I, I struggled with it, to be honest. Um, but you, you can get a sense of how they measure that displacement mm -hmm. in the trees. So just to make it simpler to understand, uh, here, here's a visual example. So uh, on the left here, you see uh, a tree that yeah. we trained. Okay, mm -hmm. So that's part of the train model. We organize the sample into, tree, into that tree. And then we add that red node that you see here. Okay, mm -hmm. And as you can see, adding that red node doesn't create a lot of uh, a lot of problems here, right? Uh, we add an extra, maybe an extra level here. Mm. 
but that's okay. It fits into the tree and it doesn't completely change the structure of the tree. So this is probably an inlier, which is the contrary of an outlier. So it's not it's not a, 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 a fraudulent transaction if we want to use the example. Um, now imagine we have an outlier, okay, and uh, now we add it to the tree. <laughs> Uh, and it creates something completely different, right? So we have uh, we have a new root, and we have a totally unbalanced tree. This this red guy here is completely <laughs> standing, you know, on the side. Uh, and again, the, the amount of disruption and displacement to the tree is very high, yeah. right? And this looks like a very bizarre, unbalanced tree compared to this. And so this would cause the anomaly score to go up, and thus we would consider this to be an outlier. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the uh, that's the basic intuition. Again, if you want to understand the math, go Good. and uh, <laughs> yeah, get some get some caffeine in your system and read the research paper. Uh, and if you want to read code, uh, there's actually an open source implementation uh, by AWS, mm -hmm. uh, which is nicely called Random Cut Forest by, by AWS. AWS. <laughs> and you can go and, and find that on GitHub. Okay. All right, that's it for uh, that's it for the algos. Okay, um, let's talk maybe quickly about some of the hyperparameters for that. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about uh, XJBoost first. Um, as we mentioned, there there are lots of hyperparameters. Mm -hmm. um, we're not going to go into uh, into all of them. Um, we said uh, XJBoost can do different things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so surely there's a parameter to say we want to do binary classification. Mm -hmm. And um, and what else? Uh, what about the imbalance thing? Can XJBoost help here yeah. directly? Yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe we can define quickly what is the imbalance. Yes, uh, please, sure. Just before. So uh, as we mentioned, we've got only um, 500 of uh, for fraudulent transaction compared to the uh, 300,000 transaction of the file. Mm -hmm. And this is um, what we call the, in machine learning the class imbalance uh, problem. So okay. the class distribution is highly imbalanced. And uh, if we apply a traditional classification algorithm such as uh, XJBoost without uh, modeling this inequality, again, I repeat, 0.0. 17% 17 17 of, um, of fraud in your data set, um, you will have a very bad and poor performance uh, because these minorities, so uh, the fraud, uh, will not be taken uh, into account by the algorithm. Mm. Uh, it will be quite forgot forgotten uh, by the algorithm. Whereas uh, most of the time, uh, when you are looking at some this kind of minority, um, this minority is our subject of interest. So you mm. don't want to uh, your minority forget forgotten by the algorithm. On the, on the contrary, you yes. want it to, to well take into account. So, so we need to boost. You yeah, need to boost. to boost those rows. So and at least say to, uh, for instance, to the XJBoost um, model. Uh, that there is there is a, a risk of imbalanced data, so we need to uh, model okay. it within the algorithm. Okay, so those rows that actually have a one saying it's fraudulent, even though we have very few of those, mm -mm. they need to give to be given extra weight. Exactly. Right? And we'll see the hyperparameter to do this. Exactly. Okay, let's let's go into the notebook. We can uh, we can look at those uh, hyperparameters again and uh, and check the metrics. Um, so let me share my screen now and. We can start looking at this code. Okay, so I'm using uh, SageMaker Studio, which uh, I think we already used in uh, episode one. It's our uh, web-based IDE for machine learning. It's based on uh, Jupyter Lab, so very familiar. It will feel very familiar if you use uh, Jupyter. Okay, so of course, initially we install uh, whatever SDK we need. Uh, we install that imbalanced learn uh, package, which we'll use uh, later on, the, the SMOT uh, algo and, and other algos. And, and off we go, right? So we start by reading our data set. We saw this, right? The PCA, PCA uh, data, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. 285,000 almost samples. Um, and we can compute some statistics, uh, although 
you know, on PCA data, I don't think this uh, is super, super useful. No. <laughs> uh, what is really important is this, right? Uh, the number of fraudulent and not fraudulent. So, mm -hmm. yeah, a little less than 500 fraudulent transactions, so point. 17%, super, super low. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, I've heard of uh, use cases where the imbalance is crazy, you know, like it's literally 0.01%, uh, uh, uh. uh, and uh, this is even more challenging. Mm. Right. Okay, so that's pretty good. Um, we separate features and labels. We split the data set for training and validation. So we'll keep 10% on the side mm -hmm. for the validation. And first we're going to train our random cut forest algo. Okay, so unsupervised learning. So no labels. No labels. Right? Just yeah. just the just the columns, just the features. Okay. So as usual, we import the SageMaker SDK. We grab an S3 bucket. This is configured in one of the scripts, but again, you can use any bucket provided that uh, your uh, IAM role gives you access to it. And we use the random cut forest estimator. So if you watch previous episodes, you kind of know what to expect. Mm -hmm. If not, well, we just grab that random cut forest object uh, from the SageMaker SDK. Uh, we have, uh, we have those objects for most of the built-in algos. Mm -hmm. We could also use the generic estimator yeah, and we would pass the container name for random cut forest in the region we're running in. Mm -hmm. We did that in the previous episode. It's kind of a shortcut that we're using here. And we say, well, go and train this on one C4 Excel instance. And that's as, as much infrastructure as we'll do. Um, where is the data? Uh, so it'll be in that S3 location. Where do we store the model? and a couple of parameters which hopefully makes sense now so we're going to train 50 trees exactly and each tree will have 512 samples mm -hmm. so it's about 25000 samples exactly okay yeah. so each tree will have about 25000 transactions organized and and they're all random so you know each tree will certainly have 25000 different transactions right mm -hmm. it's it's a random selection from those almost 300,000 that we have here, okay? So see, you can even sometimes those hyperparameters sound totally crazy, mm -mm. but if you if you read the SageMaker doc, if you take a, exactly. even a quick look mm -mm. at the research paper, and honestly, I, you know, I'll be honest with you, the math in that paper uh, was, was too uh, involved for me, given the time I, I, I could spend on it. Uh, but still, you, it's like, okay, um, 10%, each tree is 10% of my data set, which mm -hmm. sounds reasonable, right? Yeah, exactly. You, you know, it's, you could say, well, why 10? Why not 20%? Okay, go and try 20%. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Or use automatic model tuning and, and find out if you get better results by tweaking the number of trees or other number of samples. But as default, you know, 10%. Mm -mm. It's like, okay, well, I'll go and try that. But after, yes, you were right, uh, the um, documentation, the Sage, um, SageMaker documentation uh, contains a lot of description sure. of the hyperparameter, etc. So if you are not, if you don't feel very confident with your mm -hmm. choice, uh, have a look at the documentation. Uh, I use it uh, in my daily life because it is very yeah. well done and you can understand. And again, there are more parameters, yeah. but if you don't understand what they are, just don't say yeah, yeah, just okay? Don't Trust me, I try every time and I just <laughs> mess everything up. So if you don't understand what you're changing in the algo, just use the reasonable default exactly. in, in the algo, okay? All right, now we go and train. Uh, so called fit, passing the location of, uh, of our data in S3. And then uh, the usual stuff happens, right? Mm -hmm. By now we, we've seen this many times. Nothing. Create <laughs> the the instance type that we selected. Uh, pull the random cut forest container to those. Uh, download data. Get training going. Of course, you get that training log. Right. So we're not going to read that log. Right. Lots of stuff happening here. Okay. Fine. And then. Okay, then it's uh, then it stops. It trained for eighty-three seconds. Mm -hmm. So 
So that's what you pay for. Again, we did not set up spot instances here. Uh, we could probably save 70% at least if we use spot. Uh, we did this in a previous episode. And then we deploy the model. So we deploy that to a real-time endpoint. Mm -hmm. Okay, on again, one C4 Excel, uh, passing a model name and that's about it. So we wait for a few minutes and we have an endpoint. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have an HTTPS API that we can post uh, data to and get anomaly scores. And uh, and we're going to do that. And uh, there's one thing I want to call out. I, I mentioned, I think, in, in one of the previous episodes that there's a new release of the SageMaker SDK as of early August, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so if, you, if you're new to SageMaker, you can ignore what I'm going to say. If you mm -hmm. were working with SageMaker before, um, this is one of the breaking changes that mm -hmm. uh, was introduced. So for serialization and deserialization in SDK v1, you would do something like this, right? Uh, import some built-in serializers, set the content type, set the accept type, etc. cetera. Uh, in the v2 SDK, all you have to do is this. Mm. Okay, so you don't need to set the content type and the accept type anymore. Just use those those objects and you're good to go. Okay, so it's it's just a little simpler. Mm. Okay, and uh, and so yeah, I, I mentioned it a few times before, so I wanted to show you what what to do here if you need to adapt mm -hmm. uh, your notebooks. Okay, um, so we have our serialization figured out. Uh, we have a, a simple function here that. Uh, predicts uh, 500 rows mm -hmm. uh, or 500 yeah uh, scores in a row. Uh, we use the predict API, right, which is basically HTTP posting uh, data to that API. Okay, so we predict all the fraudulent examples, the one that are labeled with a one in the test set. We pre we predict the non-fraudulent examples. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we get anomaly scores for everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and now we're gonna plot it. Okay, <laughs> so we plot that stuff. Okay, using that histogram. Okay, so what what are we looking at now? The distribution. Yes. You mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the this this um uh, this this graph uh, plots you uh, the distribution of the result of uh, your lo mo machine learning model. Okay, and so we have the scores. So yeah, we get the scores, the scores here. here. Uh, and then the number of uh, the bin size. Here, the bin size, yeah. exactly. And uh, we can see that the, um, there is a clear separation uh, between the classes. And uh, so the, the model is able to capture the difference between fraud and non fraud. So it, it is interesting. Yeah, so the low scores are the non fraudulent ones, exactly. which is what we expect. And the blue ones are the high, level, the high scores, the mm. higher scores. Mm, 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 mm. And there is some separation. Yeah. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't tweak. Right? We didn't tweak. It's just like the, the beginning of the, yeah. of the story. But you can see there's already something here. So we could get better results. But I think this goes to show um, you can already, using anomaly detection, you can mm. already find uh, interesting things in your data. Yeah, this model can be your baseline, yeah. and yeah. after, of course, you will try to beat your uh, baseline, but uh, it's it's a good starting point. It's a good starting point. Yeah. Okay, so now let's try the other algo. So this time we used supervised learning. Um, so we're going to need the labels, uh, of <laughs> course. Upload that label data to S3, which we've seen so many times, right? So we upload the the training data to our bucket okay and we grab the container name for the xjboost algo mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay so looks like we're going to use the generic estimator this time we set some parameters mm -hmm. and here's that uh, uh scaling weight thing again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you need to say to your XGBoost model, be careful, we are in case of uh, an imbalance uh, data set. So uh, please add some weight uh, during mm -hmm. the training to the fraud and uh, to the fraud uh, observation. Otherwise, again, uh, they are going to, they, they will be uh, forgotten by the model. If they, you don't yeah, and it's the... the square root. I think that it's the best practice. So you take the number of negative or non-fraudulent examples, mm -hmm. Divide that by the number of fraudulent examples, mm -hmm. and you take the square root of that, mm -mm. right? 
and uh, and you need to have a full moon and uh, <laughs> and bad blood and uh, and a silver bullet and hopefully that's gonna work. Yeah. Full moon, yes. <laughs> but... Yes, the full moon is very important. It's Make sure to train on the full moon. <laughs> okay. Now, seriously, it's it's a really good parameter. So, yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. It's, square it's... root, uh, number of dominant uh, or ma majority uh, uh, class samples divided by the number of. Uh, uh, and again, this yeah. is a good good takeaway, as you say. Yeah, exactly. It's like yeah, when you've got some imbalance data, uh, think about it uh, yeah. and try to find the, to have some prepare parameters. Okay, so let's uh, yeah. So these are some of the crazier parameters in XGBoost, right? So small part. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to look at those. Uh, this is the important one. Um, we'll, we're using logistic regression, so we're building a binary classifier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that's what um, needs to be set. Yeah, it's objective. It's uh, really specifies uh, it specifies the learning task yeah. uh, you want to achieve. And... Exactly. Uh, the metric we're going to use. So we use area under curve, which is a good one for uh, yeah a good one for classifiers. And of course, the scaling factor to give more weight to those uh, yeah, uh, minority yeah. uh, samples. Okay. All right. And here we go. We use my friend estimator <laughs> past the container. Um, the hyperparameters that we looked at are infrastructure requirements, where to save the model, yeah, business as usual. Okay. We call fit, passing the location of the training set. Okay. By now you can do this with your eyes closed. Uh, fire up the instance, get the training job going. We see uh, we see the training AUC going up, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing we could probably set is, um, um, so we didn't set uh, a validation set here. We should probably do that. Yeah. Uh, and we didn't, we should set also uh, early stopping maybe mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Uh, to say, hey, if the metric stops increasing stop the training. after, you know, 20 rounds, uh, if, it, if it hasn't increased in 20 rounds, stop training, yeah, you know, exactly. don't go any further. Uh, you can you can set all of those in uh, in, in XGBoost. Okay, again, deploy this to an endpoint. So another one. Wait for a few minutes, uh, and go and predict the test set. Mm -hmm. right. And I know I'm repeating myself, but you can see that SageMaker workflow mm -hmm. again and again and again. And if some of you think, yeah, you're spending too much time on this, it's boring. Then it's, <laughs> it's great news because. Boring is good, right? <laughs> because boring means no surprises, right? It means it's you know, boring. <laughs> you know, estimator fit. What? Well, put put your data in S3. Mm -hmm. Create the estimator. Set the hyperparameters. Call fit. Call deploy. Call predict. Yeah, boring is simple. <laughs> boring is good. I love boring. Right? It works. Perfect. Yeah, episode after episode after episode. No right? magic here. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. It should be simple. It should be very straightforward. It doesn't matter if it's actually boost or crazy LSTMs. Mm -mm. It's always the same thing. Mm -mm. The only difference is the algo that you use mm -mm. and the parameters that you set. Okay, so I like that. Uh, I'm a very boring guy, <laughs> um, as you already know. Okay, so we predict. So now we have classification information. So we have probabilities mm, yeah? yes. between zero and one. Is this fraudulent or oh, not fraudulent? Yeah. So we need to, s of course, we get uh, fractional value. So we're not getting zeros and ones. Mm -hmm. yeah? We're getting values between zeros and ones. Mm -hmm. So how do we decide what's a zero and what's a one? We need to set some, some uh, threshold. Yeah, yeah? Some threshold. Yeah, so it depends on the uh, the business problem, the data, etc. Uh, but after, uh, what you are going to look at is like the um, the Cohen Co Scapa and the balance accuracy score. So it's going to help you to understand how your model uh, predicts if your model predicts well or not. And uh, most of the time, you are going to say that uh, if you have a Kappa uh, superior to 0 0.8, uh, your model is um, your model is quite good. Mm. So we could use accuracy. Yeah, accuracy. Right? The, Ac the vanilla accuracy. The vanilla so accuracy. How many correct predictions do we have? out of the total number of predictions, but with imbalanced 
data set, we use this balance accuracy and yeah. Cohen Scapa exactly. metric yeah. that takes into account the, the imbalance. The imbalance and so, so we get 90% balance accuracy and 86% which is quite good yeah. for such an imbalanced problem out yeah. of the box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it looks like that scale pause weight thing it's as like, well. Yeah, yeah? Super common. My square root <laughs> black magic, uh, you know, vampire blood thing as, as well. Okay, nice. Okay, so a good way to look at uh, classifiers is to plot the confusion matrix. Ah, uh, so famous one. Uh, also called the confusing matrix, because if you see this for the first time, it's confusing. <laughs> so you have the real classes and the predicted classes. Okay, so ideally you would have zeros here, yeah, and zero. right? Uh, so uh, because here we have, uh, so this is fraud and, it is and it's non-fraud. So that's a false negative and uh -huh. this is a false positive. Mm -hmm. So we would have zeros, but it's not that simple. We always have some mispredictions. Mm -hmm. But you can see we're doing a very good job here. It's a beautiful right? job. <laughs> well, we're doing a very good job. We have very few misclassified uh, transactions. So that's pretty nice. Right? And we can see some more information, which is yeah, really just one and yeah, and the, the, the same thing in, in you know, uh, the same thing for the matrix. But okay. uh, for people who are not familiar with this confusion matrix, yes. it is super important to spend time yeah. to understand this, um, the two uh, axes. So in real life, we would look at those mispredictions. Yeah. Okay? Okay. We would actually look at the samples that were mispredicted and say, okay, why did we mispredict? Mm -hmm. Would a human actually be fooled as well? Or is the model lacking something? Mm -hmm. Are we, maybe if we add an extra feature in the data set, we can get those right. There are plenty mm -hmm. of options here. But we need to understand why those 12 uh, predictions in the test set uh, were wrong. Okay, but it's 12 out of uh, 28,000, right? mm -hmm. so that's pretty good. Okay, so to close things off, uh, let's quickly discuss how we could uh, work on the imbalance problem. Mm -hmm. Right? Remember, we have 0.17%, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. which is very low. Uh, and so there are a number of algos uh, and techniques to try and fix, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So um, they're implemented in this package called Imbalance Learn, and I, I strongly encourage you to take a look. Mm -hmm. There are, I would say, simple techniques like uh, uh, oversampling, mm -hmm. so uh, just duplicating mm -hmm. samples from the minority class, the just minority. literally duplicating them to add more. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also remove samples from the dom from the majority, majority. class, mm -hmm. so under sampling, and it's very simple. You can do it just like that, or you can use a more fancy family of algos that generate synthetic samples mm -hmm. that look like the quote, real, quote, one. Yeah. real uh, minority samples, and mm -hmm. that's the smote algo, right? So that's what we're doing here by default, and we're doing it. We're using the sledgehammer here because we're literally oversampling <laughs> from 0.17% to 50%. So we're re completely, perfectly rebalancing the data. It's like a big one. <laughs> Which is a little brutal, I think. Yeah, yeah? It's very, very brutal rebalancing. Uh, so that's how you do it. Create that small object, call this resample, mm -hmm. fit resample, okay? that will generate, as you can see, uh, the same amount of uh, uh, minority samples as you had uh, majority samples. So now it's really equality, right? 50-50. Mm -hmm. And then we train again and the rest, it's a new data set. We save it, upload it to S3. We train again. Uh, of course, we remove this, uh, the scale pause weight parameter, mm -hmm. right? We train, right? So exactly the same workflow here. We deploy again. Mm -hmm. We predict again, and we get uh, a balance accuracy this time of 0.91255. Mm -hmm. Is that a little better? Let me it's check. a bit better than uh, the... Um, what did we get here? But not the um, capas. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Yeah. Okay. It, it's a little better. It's okay. We point nine. So we are 92, oh, sorry, 90.2% mm -hmm. and 86. Okay. Remember those? And now we have, I'm getting there. 
Okay, we have 91.2, so balance accuracy is better, better with... but Cohen's kappa is not as good. Mm -mm, mm -mm. And if we look at the confusion matrix, we actually see uh, we actually see we have a few more mistakes. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Uh, we have a few more mistakes. So the uh, in particular, this has gone up quite a bit. Yeah. So uh, you would have to see and understand why. Again, look at those. Um, and see what's going on. Uh, my gut feeling is that uh, resampling from 0.17% to 50% is is very brutal. So <laughs> it's, it's kind of you know, <laughs> yeah, we kind of sh we're shifting the data set in a totally di different direction. So it's probably a little too much. But after uh, when you work with uh, real uh, real world data, uh, these modes and uh, dealing with these uh, diff using different techniques can really improve yeah. dramatically sure. your model. Sure. So here in the case, our kappa is not increasing, but sometimes it's mm -hmm. super important to use those modes. Procedure. And at the end of the day, um, you have to decide what's worse. Do you, do you want to optimize? Do you want fewer? false negatives yeah. or do you want fewer false positives mm, mm, mm. and it really depends on the data set. exactly and the business problem, the business problem. Uh, do you want to flag legitimate transactions are fraudulent or do you want to uh, flag fraudulent transactions as non-fraudulent mm, mm. it's probably okay to call me and say uh, <laughs> we need you to verify some security information just to make sure i'm not a criminal mm, mm. Um, so I wouldn't mind if you, unless you call me every single day, but um, <laughs> you don't want to, to let fraudulent transactions yeah, exactly. go through. So you would probably decide, okay, let's have as few fraudulent transactions as possible. And if that means we have to call a few customers to check information, then fine, we can do that. Mm -hmm. right? But maybe it's the other way. I mean, only you can, can decide that. All right, we're almost done. Uh, so I think that's uh, as much as we can cover today. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's try to maybe recap everything while I share the, the, the final slide. All right. So questions and feedback, SageMaker Fridays at Amazon.com, right? Um, as usual. All right, I'll, I'll put all those resources on screen uh, so that you can uh, uh, you can take the screenshot, um, no need to list everything you recognize what those URLs, URLs are. Um, as I mentioned before, I published a book on SageMaker. You can get a sweet discount. Uh, here are the uh, the codes. This is only valid until November 11th. So uh, don't, don't write to me on November 12th. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I won't be able to help. Right. So what did we cover today? Can we quickly recap? Yeah, yeah. So uh, during this episode, uh, we learned how to use uh, Amazon SageMaker to train fault detection models using first the building algorithm. So uh, have a look on the, um, on the documentation because for every kind of mostly every kind of business uh, ML problem you can have uh, built in uh, in SageMaker. And after we introduced this notion of class imbalance data. Uh, so uh, we've covered a lot of room and there is of course plenty more to learn and uh, have a look at this uh, screenshot time as yeah, you say yeah. and see you next week read all of it read all of it <laughs> for another all right. uh, interesting episode of SageMaker Fridays absolutely yeah I think next week we'll discuss uh, uh, we'll discuss some other algos and uh, <laughs> we'll talk about you know credit uh, and interesting things. Okay. Well, we'll uh, we'll definitely keep diving into machine learning. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for watching this. Uh, I hope you're learning. I hope you got all your questions answered. If not, you can send us an email, and uh, you can show up next Friday for a future episode. Uh, thanks to my AWS colleagues who were answering questions and helping with uh, with this uh, Twitch session. And until next week. Uh, thank you very much, Segalen, of course. Thank you. Where, what would I do without you? And uh, until next week, keep rocking with machine learning. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>